Welcome to Gospel Perspectives on World History, and I'm your host, Michael Stone. Thank you for joining us as we uh, begin looking at the secular history of the world through the lens of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. While this podcast is primarily geared towards members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, anyone who has an interest in topics of faith and history are welcome to join us. And as an important legal notice, while I do intend to center what I share as much as possible on the verified details of the historical record and on ancient and modern scripture approved by the church, I do want to stress that the views I share here do not necessarily represent official doctrine, policy, or the views of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and that I take full responsibility for the content and programming of this podcast. So we will continue today to move eastward as we leave ancient India, where we last discussed the Harappan uh, civilization, or more appropriately, the Indus River Valley civilization. Today, we will, however, examine another society that, although most Western listeners are familiar with the fact that it does stand out among the ancient civilizations, not many people on the street, at least uh, in the U.S., uh, can tell you much about it. And considering how impactful this modern nation is for all of us around the globe, I believe it is critical to be familiar with its origins and history. So today, we will be discussing ancient China. So, the earliest human inhabitation of what we now call China today began almost a million years ago. Several prehistoric clans eventually developed a systematic farming in, in, in this area. That's uh, the Neolithic Revolution to those of you who've been listening to this podcast. And uh, they began developing several distinct cultures here. Some of them began farming at 8,000 BC and diminished uh, long before other groups, which uh, developed farming and thus their own distinct cultures around uh, in 1900 BC. So uh, these disparate groups all developed beautiful art and pottery, and at times were in serious conflict with each other. So it is not very accurate to say that there was a distinct unifying Chinese national identity uh, during this time period. There are a few developments from this time that will bear a, a unique significance on later history, uh, though I'm not going to be pretentious enough to suggest that this is by any means a, a comprehensive uh, list or survey uh, of those uh, significant accomplishments. So uh, what I did want to highlight, though, is that during these uh, thousands of years, a few of the cultures came to greatly revere family ties to the point that ancestral worship became a key feature of their cultures. We see this trait prominently featured, for example, with uh, the uh, Dawan Ko, who used turquoise, jade, and ivory to create exquisite necklaces and jewelry to adorn their dead. And militaristic cultures even celebrated past warlords by creating ornate tombs for them to rest in. The practice of human sacrifice attending the death of an elite member of society underscored their, their uh, importance to society. And not only at the time of their burial, but also uh, forever after, as the victims were also often laid to rest with their leaders they served. So keep in mind that ancestral worship and a veneration for their warrior kings, those are uh, some things that will come up later. Now, uh, on to the Shang Dynasty. First, I suppose I should define what a dynasty is, because that isn't always a familiar term for everyone. A dynasty is a period of time in history where one family line governs the region or culture. And for Chinese history, it becomes fairly convenient for us to divide its uh, pre-modern history into dynasties, as the leaders who rule China during each dynasty tend to be shaped by uh, similar influences and exert a similar influence on the world around them. It should also be noted that this... Uh, style of rule lasts from ancient uh, uh, Chinese history all the way up until the 1900s. Uh, so uh, that's going to cover quite a bit of Chinese history. So today we're only going to go over the first uh, dynasty, but uh, we are uh, going to uh, just do that and get to the other dynasties in future episodes. So 
Now, uh, for uh, some who are uh, familiar with Chinese history, uh, they might ask me why I don't begin with the uh, Xia uh, dynasty. That's uh, spelled X-I-A for those who are listening. Uh, it's true that uh, the Shang uh, dynasty recorded that they revolted against uh, the Xia uh, to first establish their own line of rule. But beyond their accounts of that dynasty, historians have not found any concrete evidence that the Shah uh, or even their legendary founder, you the warrior, ever existed. So the question naturally becomes, well, why invent this dynasty if that is indeed the fact that the Shah did not exist in the first place? Well, this, like most other founding myths or histories propagated by both ancient and modern cultures, were shared for a purpose. Remember, before the Shang dynasty, as I had mentioned, there was no concept of national unity for the Chinese, and they had only managed to unite some of the groups around them. We make mention of the Shang dynasty and tend to focus on them more because it is their art, architecture, and style of government and overall culture that future larger dynasties in Chinese history trace their inheritance from. So again, the Shang come to power and with a large group of people who aren't necessarily used to being grouped together and being forced to uh, work together, you're going to need a pretty convincing explanation for why your dynasty has legitimate authority over them. And that is where the Shang introduce the concept of the mandate of heaven. So the Shang's claim was that at one point in time, the Shah uh, did have uh, the right to rule, granted to them by heaven. At this point in time, one could take heaven to mean the gods, though it is critical to note that for later dynasties, this concept becomes much less deistic or god-focused, and instead is more seen as the cosmos, or the general powers of light or righteousness, ordaining this authority on good moral leaders. The Shang explained, however, that the Shah only had this mandate as long as their leaders kept order in the country, and led moral lives, promoting that same kind of morality in their people as well. The Shang accused the Shah of abandoning this moral high ground over time, giving in to corruption, overlooking the needs of the poor, and thus heaven would respond by answering that iniquity with famine, war, or in the case of the Shang, rebellion. And by all accounts, this idea of the mandate to rule granted by heaven is a successful sell to the people. So much so that not only does the Shang dynasty last around 400 years, but the idea of the mandate of heaven far outlasts them, becoming not only the way new dynasties would seek to legitimize their rule as they overthrew old dynasties, but it also became the primary lens uh, through which those recording the history at the time told the story of these dynasties. So, at this point, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints are probably having a serious case of deja vu. This is a kind of cyclical pattern of history with which we are very familiar. For with the mandate of heaven, history follows in general the same kind of pride cycle that Latter-day Saints discuss in Sunday school. Uh, and it generally goes uh, something like this. You'll see uh, someone draw uh, kind of a, a cyclical uh, a chart uh, on the chalkboard or whiteboard or whatever have you uh, with uh, four main points that kind of feed back into each other. So step one, heaven sees that a group, especially their leaders, are becoming corrupt. War, famine, devastation follow until either that group represents... <clears throat> So, uh, step one, heaven sees that a group, especially their leaders, are becoming corrupt. War, famine, and devastation follow until either that group repents or a new group takes hold and reestablishes righteous rule. Step two, those people are blessed and are prosperous because they live righteously. Step three, the leaders and their people become corrupt again, which leads to step four, we do it all over again. So, we see this pattern played out in the Book of Mormon very often, as well as in the Old Testament. In fact, one of the more tragic parts of reading the Book of Helaman in particular 
is that it just seems to be about every year they go through the cycle. They sin, they suffer, they repent, they are saved, blessed, then sin again. They go through that cycle about as fast as a rat on a hamster wheel after drinking four times his body weight in Red Bull. It's insane. But as easy as it may be for me to look back on the Nephites of the Chinese and uh, for us to kind of shake our heads at them and go, oh, why, why did they just repeat this over and over again? My seminary teacher in my uh, junior year of high school helped uh, point out to me that pride cycles don't just apply to nations and cultures, but to us as individuals as well. Society today is eager to market pride to us. Whether it's the unearned self-congratulation of having been born into one family or area or country as opposed to another, or the pride of believing that you must be a more worthwhile child of God because you happen to sin differently than others, or the pride of believing that you can handle this temptation that just a little bit, just once won't hurt. That is precisely how the adversary can get us rolling around like that furry little idiot rat in that hamster wheel. It could be the pride of patting ourselves on the back for not smelling like that smoker sitting a few pews behind us in church. It can be the pride of thinking that, nah, I've heard enough of this kind of Sunday talk before. I can just text friends or play Candy Crush on my phone instead. It can be the pride of thinking that your trials, your illness, your sins are too great for even the Savior of the world to handle and that therefore it is just better to despair. Perhaps it could be the pride of picking and choosing which counsel we follow from living prophets. In short, where I see myself or others begin to roll around in that upcheck inducer of a hamster wheel we call the pride cycle, is the moment when we begin to think that we, or I should remind myself, I, begin to think that I am an exception to the rule. Exceptionalism is the psychoactive ingredient in the opiate we call pride. And I am ashamed to admit it, but I have been hooked thousands of times. I've fallen for it so many times. Exceptionalism is sneaky, seductive, and it is always flatteringly packaged. And I have noticed that I am most vulnerable to exceptionalism when things are going well. Mormon makes the same point in Helaman in chapter 12, uh, verse uh, 2 and 3. And I'll quote him. Yea, and we may see at the very time when he, uh, that is God, uh, doth prosper his people, yea, in the increase of their fields, their flocks and their herds, and in gold and in silver, and in all manner of precious things of every kind, and art, sparing their lives and delivering them out of the hands of their enemies, softening the hearts of their enemies that they should not declare wars against them, yea, and in fine, doing all things for the welfare and happiness of his people. Yea, then is the time that they do harden their hearts, and do forget the Lord their God, and do trample under their feet the Holy One. Yea, and this because of their ease and their exceedingly great prosperity. And thus we see that except the Lord doth chasten his people with many afflictions, yea, except he doth visit them with death and with terror and with famine and with all manner of pestilence, they will not remember him, close quote. So, while I do find it valid to point out that, that the uh, mandate of heaven might not be a perfect model for fully understanding Chinese dynastic history, since there are some legitimate points as to whether or not this tends to focus too much on the elites of society and their style of rule, as opposed to the common people of China also having significant meaningful uh, perspectives for us to understand. I do think, though, that uh, for the large part, the mandate of heaven is perhaps a more valid mechanism for understanding Chinese history than uh, most could possibly know. Gosh, aren't I a smart one to have made that uh, connection? How enlightened must I be compared to those other historic... Oh, darn, there goes that exceptionalism again. <laughs> anyway, so back to the Shang Dynasty. Yes, uh, they introduced the concept of the mandate of heaven, but that wouldn't have really been as lasting an impact on Chinese history uh, without their writing system. It is the first enduring writing system that we have from China, though it had a unique trait to it that distinguishes it from some of the others that we have talked about. 
It was a logographic script as opposed to a phonographic script, meaning that uh, whereas many written systems use characters to represent phonological sounds or parts of words, the early Chinese alphabet wasn't really an alphabet, but a series of symbols that each represented a unique concept or idea uh, and not a sound. You'd have separate symbols for warrior or field, with only some instances where two or more symbols would be combined to represent new ideas. So, like, think something akin to compound words like doghouse in English. Anyway, as you might imagine, this is a, a very challenging writing system for people to learn, and thus only the people who could afford the time to study it are going to be able to use and understand it. And that is how access to learning, education, and literature was really exclusive to social elites uh, of the time. So, still with that writing system, the Shang were able to organize their culture to accomplish a lot uh, during their time. Their capital, uh, Zhengzhou, was able to get a massive wall built around their city that was 30 feet high and 60 feet thick. To better picture it, that's one telephone pole tall and two telephone poles thick. And that wall was more than four miles long. And these people were able to build that wall in 10 years. Over time, unfortunately, the Shang did fall victim to their own pride cycle, however. Their militaristic rulers grew increasingly cruel, demanding ever greater numbers of human sacrifices. And I found one account uh, that uh, details a, a king who had over 9,000 people sacrificed in one day. Now, these normally were prisoners of war and other captives, but you can imagine how that uh, sacrifice of uh, prisoners of war would not exactly endear yourself to your neighbors. And that is why, uh, ultimately, the Shang are overthrown and supplanted by a new dynasty, one that will introduce some of the greatest contributions to world religion and philosophy for years to come. And that is where we will leave China for now. We will return to China's story in the future, uh, but uh, we will, in this next episode, head back to Mesopotamia, which is undergoing some interesting changes. Just as the Hebrews have left Egypt and are attempting to establish themselves in Israel, we have some serious threats on the horizon for everyone in the region, including one of the most notoriously brutal empires in history, the Assyrians. So, uh, if you've been enjoying this podcast, I'd ask that you leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, and if you know others who would enjoy this series, uh, please consider sharing it with them. An easy way to do that is to use the link in the episode description for our show's uh, website and share that on your ward's social media page so that other members of the church can enjoy the show as well. And I would like to thank everyone who has supported the launch of this podcast, including my lovely wife, my kids, and my loving brother-in-law, Spencer, uh, for suggesting that I go through with this idea. And again, uh, thank you for listening, and stay safe out there.